Hello, um, I'd like to start by thanking the organisers for the invitation to present at this workshop. Um, so my name is Francis Wong. I'm from the University of Dundee. I lead and curate the image data resource IDR. And today I'm going to show you some of the data we have in IDR and what can be achieved when you publish image data sets along with metadata for annotations. Now I'm aware um, that not all of you work with image data. So let's start by asking ourselves, what is image data? Image data consists of an image file, which is pixel or binary data. Some image files also contain information describing the image, such as channels, Z-stack planes and time points. And this information is saved within the image file. There is also metadata, which is an important part of image data. By metadata, I mean experimental details that are not saved in the image file. For example, sample details, such as cell line or organism, sample preparation and labeling. So this is the type of data where only the scientists who conducted the experiment can provide. And when you have an image file along with its metadata, you have enriched image data. How does metadata enrich image files? Metadata enriches image files by helping users to make sense of the pixel information. This metadata is referred to as annotations. It can take time and effort to provide annotations with images, but your data will be more valuable as you can make, as you can then um, perform cross-study investigations and cross-study analysis with, these, with this data. This enriched image data is the type of data we have in IDR. And I'm going to show you some of the ways we have used metadata in our resource. For those of you who don't work with images, this doesn't matter because the importance of metadata can apply to non-image files as well. But I will be using images as examples because IDR is a great resource for image data. Okay, so a quick introduction to IDR. IDR is a public image resource and our vision is to work towards making image data generated by the scientific community publicly available and reusable via image archives and databases. IDR has been working to achieve this goal by making our image data publicly accessible at idr.openmicroscopy.org. Working with reference datasets, which are complete datasets containing molecular and functional annotations that are associated with an existing or upcoming publication. By integrating studies or datasets with other datasets, such as through genes, compounds, or phenotypes. Having curated metadata and enabling uh, data reanalysis via the cloud. IDR has over 115 studies, cross-published in different journals and cross-referenced via accessions and DOIs. More specifically, this is 32 million image files, over 89,000 genes and 40,000 compounds. This amounts to 353 terabytes of imaging data. And since the start of 2019, the data volume growth has been about 75 terabytes per year. This audience in particular may be interested in the organisms we have in IDR. Out of the 71 organisms currently in IDR, 52 of these are plants. These plants can be found in two IDR studies, IDR 134 and IDR 137. Let's have a closer look at one of these datasets. 
taking diplophyllum albicans in IDR134 as an example, we see the images for this data set in the central panel. Selecting the image highlighted in blue as an example, you will see its annotations on the right-hand panel, such as organism and phenotype. Now let's have a closer look at these. Starting with phenotype, you can see that this image has been annotated with the round cell phenotype, and it has a phenotype term accession number. This indicates that this term is using a standard vocabulary, more specifically, the CMPO ontology, which stands for Cellular Microscopy Phenotype Ontology. If you scroll down under attributes, you will see another section called others. Here we see additional information provided by the submitter. The most noteworthy for this audience are the GBIF, which stands for Global Diversity Information Facility, and open tree accession numbers for this organism, Diplophyllum albicans. Now the submitter included these accession numbers as part of the metadata for this image, as these are plant-specific ontologies which are used by the plant community. So this leads me on to ontologies. Here is a list of the public ontologies we are currently using in IDR. For organism, we use the NCBI taxonomy. For study type, high content screen types, and protocol, we use the EFO. For imaging method, we use the FBBI. And for phenotype, we use the CMPO. For gene, we use either Ensemble or NCBI gene. And for protein, we use Uniprot. IDR has also been receiving more clinical data and compound screens. So we have been using SNOMED CT for clinical data and PubChem for compounds. This is a list of the types of metadata which IDR can provide links to. And this in turn creates rich data sets with added value for our users. There are of course other standard vocabularies and ontologies, such as GBIF and OpenTree as mentioned in the previous slide. We currently don't link out to these ontologies but the metadata is still available to users if they wish to use these ontologies. And this is thanks to the submitter for, for providing this information. Now, I want to show you how standard vocabularies and ontologies are used in IDR. We are using them in different ways, such as grouping the metadata from one study and linking it to another study linking to external resources, querying metadata by web UI and by API. I will show you an example of each of these. Starting with linked metadata. In IDR, we group attributes together, such as genes and phenotypes. We see here in this example, IDR12, that there is a phenotype of elongated cells associated with the ash tail gene. If you click on the ash tail gene, it will show you a list of studies with results for this gene and thus linking between studies. The elongated cell phenotype has been annotated with a CMPO ontology term. And as I mentioned before, CMPO is the cellular microscopy phenotype ontology. Ontology terms sub allow submitters to normalize phenotypes. So different submitters may express very similar phenotypes in different words, but we can use the ontology to link them to a common term. And this is the same as what Henrietta was saying in her previous presentation. So searching for the elongated cell phenotype, CMPO term, we can get back studies with submitter phenotypes relating to the elongation of cells. For linking to external resources, 
you may have spotted that there is an icon next to the gene identifier. Indeed, if you click on it, it will take you to the NCBI webpage for the gene ASH2L. The same for the phenotype turnout session, the icon is linked to the web page for the elongated cell phenotype. Now, let's have a look at the IDR homepage. You can see that IDR currently has 353 terabytes of imaging data, consisting of 119 studies and over 13 million five-dimensional images. When new studies are released in IDR, these numbers are also updated for every public release. Above this panel, we have a search box where you can type in a term without selecting a search field. So if you type in PAT6, the search will auto-populate the best matches to this term. And then you can select to see the images for the PAT6 gene symbol or PAT6 antibody, etc. If we select the PAT6 gene symbol, it takes us to the search results page. We can see that a search query for the gene symbol PAT6 finds 2,342 images in nine experiments or screens. Let's select IDR70 as an example. Here, you can see thumbnails of all the PAT6 images for this experiment. And this is true for all the other experiments or screens on this results page. These thumbnails are a new feature that we have added to visually help users in finding the images they are interested in more quickly. You can go directly from each thumbnail to its image in the image viewer or its study data. Accessing this data directly is a recent improvement we've made to the search, and we hope users will find this useful. If a user would like to perform another search query, they can use the search box at the top here, or you can use the home button above it which takes you back to the home page where you started. Okay, now I'd like to show you a workflow example of obtaining information from one resource and then coming to IDR to find image data related to this information. IDR has published this example in Workflow Hub. In this example, we start with the resource HumanMind. HumanMind is an integrated database of human genomic data where you can search for genes, proteins, etc. So you can find information from this resource, such as identifying genes of interest. Then you can come to IDR with your gene list, ask a specific biological question, and see the images in IDR for these genes. An example question could be, which diabetes-related genes are expressed in the pancreas? To start answering this question, we obtain a list of diabetes-related genes expressed in the pancreas from human mind. Then we use the IDR Multiomics API to search for images in IDR associated with this gene list. Taking PDX1 as an example, here you can see the IDR images linked to the PDX1 gene, and we have images at four different developmental stages. These images are from IDR70 by Kerwin et al. Now, we were able to retrieve these images from a search query, as these images have been annotated with a gene name and gene symbol. If we didn't have metadata with our image files, we wouldn't be able to perform any of these um, search queries. So I hope this has illustrated how useful metadata is and what can be achieved with rich data. Hopefully, it will encourage you to use standard vocabularies and ontologies 
and include metadata with your files. For those of you who are interested in using some of the images in IDR, imaging data for all studies published in IDR is available for download using the Aspera protocol. IDR's mission is to make reference image datasets as widely available as possible. Therefore, the majority of IDR datasets are published under a CCBY license. The CCBY license allows anyone to copy, distribute, and adapt the work as long as credit is given to the creator. So IDR studies published under this permissive license allows users to share and reuse the data. If you have a reference data set you would like to submit to IDR, or you might have one in future, the first step is to send an email to idr at openmicroscopy.org. Once we confirm your data set is a reference data set suitable for IDR, we will ask you to upload the original raw image files to us. Of course, you will also need to fill in metadata templates. When all checks have passed, the data set is scheduled for release and then published in IDR. Now, to quickly summarize, the IDR is publicly available, curated studies submitted by the community in a searchable, scalable platform that links metadata and enables reanalysis that can be deployed by others. This just leaves me to thank our funders and everyone on the IDR team. Please join us at the end of June for the FAIR data session when Jean-Marie Borel will be presenting a practical, a more practical approach to image data um, using some of the data in IDR. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frances. It's a very interesting work and uh... Again, I learned a lot. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. And uh, uh, maybe if uh, uh, in the audience people have some questions, it will be the time just to, uh, just to, I don't know, if you, if you have uh, some questions, it, it's, Clearly, uh, a good moment because we have some times and uh, to. Celine, I have a question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just wanted to ask um, Jean Marie and Francis um, how this project started and like when it started, just to give some sort of time scale to how these projects kind of develop and how long it takes for these projects to get going. Because these are really large, this is a really large infrastructure project. Uh, okay, again, uh, IDEA, uh, well, IDEA is based on uh, a framework that is called Omero, which started, um, I would say, a long time ago. Uh, Omero, maybe not there. But uh, because what we have to deal here on top of ontology, is also data management and data management is uh, quite problematic especially in images those images are getting very very big we're talking about one image could be terabyte one terabyte or a few terabytes so it's a it's a, a challenge so we, we have built a, an infrastructure that anybody can use uh, it's free uh, freely available People can run that into the institution, which manage uh, all the images, metadata associated. That what Francis have shown, and IDR is, uh, I would say, the the flagship on top uh, of it, which is all the public access, and that is much more recent. That's uh, only 2016, I think. So it's you know it's fairly recent. And Francis, can you remind? Yeah. It's a uh, you you join. Yeah, I think officially 
IDR started in 2015, I think that's what. Uh, yeah, the ground, but the same, something yeah. out of the ground was 2016. And you joined us and then in I 20... joined in September 2018. 2018. Yeah. So yeah, there's a, a long effort. And the reason is for images to read them, to store them. And over time, over time we have found solution. Now we have faces, we're facing new challenges which is the size of the data is extremely big. So we now uh, have readjusting a file where the file will be available through IDR and store outside IDR if you, in the, in the you cloud draw, environment. You can draw the data in basically into your platform from outside. Well, yeah. in, in a sense, yes. So the binary data, all the images will be living somewhere else. And IDR, so when you want to view an image, for example, you will fetch the data from completely different resource. Mm -hmm. IDR still encapsulate all the nice uh, annotation that Francis highlighted, all the linkage, the search functionality. So basically a, a very nice way of getting that, that resource available. But when you want to view the, the it's, people will not know where it's coming from. It's kind of yeah. technical aspect. And those are the challenges we face. So it's always an evolution. So, and I think it's great that uh, you guys are starting of linking the pieces because uh, what Frances have shown and is very recent, the work we did with human mind. And we have done that with also at the mouse level with things like infra frontier and mouse mind is we are now, when you put a lot of effort into the ontology and Frances might give you an average of how long it takes to get a study in. It really depends on the quality of the of the information, but that enables you to do much, much more afterwards. So human mind is one example. I was showing uh, this morning at a, a different training for image images. People, we also have a lot of uh, analytical results that people can then compare. So it's a it become a, a resource of reference. You want to test a new analytical technique, you can do there. You want to, to look for unrelated study that, uh, you know, like uh, case of human mind, uh, Francis, there is some that are related to the human protein atlas that are completely unassociated to other study, but you can actually find that knowledge and compare, do analysis on them or visualization, whatever you want to do after with the data. And that's the kind of the, the message for us, but it, it takes time. So if you can use a framework that your data will fit in, whatever that is, I know you have been in contact with the, is it National uh, Museum? Or, I can't remember, am I this? Yeah, some national the national archives. Archive, um, national archives, yeah. yeah. So if you have a resource that you can tap in, I will recommend it because what you don't want to you want to focus on the ontological part, annotation part, etc. But and if you have other people that can do the infrastructure for you, that's much better because that's also time consuming. And Francis mm -hmm. you will know very well how much it takes us to just to run run the ship because this is the ship at its glory but it, you need you need a lot of effort to run it the infrastructure the resource and all this kind of stuff which is that come at the cost uh, financial cost but also human cost to to make it happen thanks so much yeah and, and but the human cost really depends on your data set um you know yes. we have some very very large data sets and so um Sometimes that takes a lot more work, um, but no, that was a thank you for the question. <laughs> um, I don't know if we have time um, because there's actually another question in the chat, which I thought I would just answer here. Yes, we do. Everyone. We do have time. So okay, so um, I'll just say thank you for the question, Diana. And so Diana's question was: Is there access to the metadata template before emailing our data sets via email? And yes, in a way that we can organize the metadata beforehand. So the answer is yes, definitely. Um, 
So when you contact us, I, I didn't want to sort of go into the details during my presentation, but when you um, contact us and when we confirm it's a reference data set, we will provide you with um, instructions for firstly uploading your um, image files to us, and that's generally via FTP or via Globus. And then we'll also provide you with metadata templates so that you can fill in um, the annotations for us. So that's all um, provided to you um, once you contact us. Um, so, and there we can also provide you with um, metadata examples um, so that you, it will help you um, fill in the metadata templates. So you'll have examples of the existing um, templates that for the studies that we already have in IDR. So you will have um, yeah, examples to look at. And depending on your data type, if there's already an existing study um, in IDR, you can really look at that template. If, it's, if you have more of a new study type, then um, I can work with you to um, help you um, fill out the template if, it's, uh, if we don't have an example of that type of data already in IDR. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Diana. GM, you have a question? I don't have a question. I've got a comment. And it's uh, to relate to what Ariette was mentioning uh, before, because about ontology and the service that uh, Ariette and the team are running, because as Henriette indicated, the ontology, we use certain, Francis said we use certain ontology, but Henriette is also working on a great tool uh, called OXO, which allowed to, Henriette might want to say more, but basically it's allowed to, to bridge knowledge between ontology. I hope I got that right, um, Henriette. And we have actually used that because sometimes you come with an ontological term and you go to IDR and it give you zero result. Okay, it's frustrating. You go to OXO and uh, you put some parameter and it give you some related ontological term from different ontology, which is great. And then you go back to IDR and then you find images. So all the services, so, so we have seen with uh, human mind, you go to other resources, you get result, but that also can happen at the ontological level. And that can be done programmatically. You don't have to go all the time to the web front end and type value and find. This can be done programmatically. And it's a there, there's a lot of great tools out there that will help you out. So sometimes the ontology might die or disappear, you choose another one, but because there's this tool combining everything, the work is never lost and can be very useful down the line. So that's was just a comment to link the two elements there, and it's both have, uh, can bring you a lot of knowledge at the end. Thank you very much. It's very informative because uh, I know a little bit of the work of Henriette, but uh, it's uh, still expanding to uh, to know more about it, actually. Yeah, there's plenty there. I don't know if Henriette exactly, is so. anything there about OXO. If I hope I explain it correctly, what you can do with it from a very practical yes. standpoint, Henriette. Yeah, I, I think that's perfect. Um, the problem is that um, some of these ontologies very often get created in different communities and people don't necessarily talk with each other and they don't know about each other. Um, and so there is this need to be able to map between ontologies as well. Um, so, yeah. Um, but there's a great standard called SESM that is also now being developed as well. Um, and we are working on an update of um, uh, the OXO tool to support this uh, SESAM standard. The problem is that currently, and I think that came out in the example that I've showed as well, that some of this mapping information can at times sit in an ontology. And the problem is that the, when this information sits in the ontology, it, or the mapping it, information can change independent of the ontology. So nothing in the ontology changed, but because the mappings changed, now you have to update the ontology. And for that reason, there is this drive in the community to split mappings out from the ontology. And that, that was actually a good idea. Um, 
and that is what the whole session standard is about is about these mappings and there's also some issues with the mappings in terms of what they mean and what the system standard does is to try and um, have a slightly more um, a better guidance with regards to what these uh, mappings mean because in the existing OXO if you do a mapping at times it can be a bit unclear as to exact the exact uh, meaning so if I say um, this term is equivalent to that term I really mean that all the elements of this term is the same as that term and also the relationships and often when people use equivalence in that regard that's not necessarily what they mean and then you can also say that something is related well something is related could mean anything from it's um, supposed to be the same thing to um, it's vaguely related um, and for that reason they've also start, started um, there's this huge effort around the system standard um, and why we're also building the new OXO tool um, if that's helpful at all.